put her in Hines County Jail. And I've got my ticket to get down there. Hi, I'm Taylor. And I'm Christian. And, and we, we are, are TK2 to to LDC News. Today we are continuing our chapter of Women We Look Up To with Miss Joan Maholland. And so, let's begin. So what made you want to join the Silver Rights Movement? Well, I'm a Southerner. My mother's family is from rural Georgia. I grew up here in Robert E. Lee's hometown of Arlington, Virginia. And I could see with the segregation and things that it wasn't fair. We'd go to church and we'd learn these Bible verses about how to live, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, and love thy neighbor as thyself. But then we were hypocrites. We weren't doing that. And I thought as a Southerner, when I got a chance to help make the South the best that it could be, I should do what I could. And that brought me to the Civil Rights Movement when the students started demonstrating. So what made you become a freedom writer and put your life in danger? Well, I had already been involved with the sit-ins and the Washington, D.C. sit-in group from Howard. It was called NAG, the Nonviolent Action Group. And one of our members, Hank Thomas, was on that bus that got burned. And when we saw the pictures of Hank by the bus, there was no question we were going to keep the Freedom Rides going, just like the students in Nashville thought. And so three of our group were out the door just as quick as the Nashville crowd. I stayed back um, and helped recruit more people to go. In fact, I got a call from Paul Dietrich, one of our group. He was trapped in that church in Montgomery with Dr. King when they were tear gassing and all that and everybody could make a phone call that was just, you know, two minutes long. And he called me because he knew I had a small apartment and the phone was near my bed. And he said, I can't talk. I'm trapped in, we're trapped in the church. Send more writers. So by June 7th or so, a, I was with a group that left. Others had gone from D.C. before us, but we flew down to um, New Orleans and took the train up to Jackson, and Stokely Carmichael, who was part of our group and later became known for you know, Black Power, he was, he was with us, and Stokely and I were friends to the end. But it was in the teachings of Gandhi that if and we followed Gandhi for nonviolence as well as Jesus, that if somebody falls by the wayside and can't continue, others take their place. So keeping the freedom ride going was just the obvious thing to do. So when we read about you, um, it said you were 50 feet from the death chamber. Mm -hmm. um, what were your feelings when you were 50 feet from the death chamber? Well, we knew we were on death row. They had taken the prisoners off of death row and put them elsewhere in the prison. And we knew it was, they were trying to intimidate us. You know, not any newspaper men are up here, you know, no one can hear you if you scream. We knew we were on death row, but we didn't know exactly where the death chamber was. We found that out later. But in reality, we had a lot more room than we had in the Hines County Jail. We'd gotten that really overcrowded. Um, it was a lot cleaner and newer, and the food was better. So aside from the isolation and the intimidation psychology, it was a step up. Um, so, and, you know, I was a southerner, and the prison guards and the matron and all that were southerners, so I was within my culture. I knew these folks and um, culturally. And so I wasn't near as intimidated and scared as a lot of the freedom riders who started coming down from the north. They were like prisoners of war in their mind, but I was at home. I knew what grits and black eyed peas were. So what are your thoughts on Rachel Dolezal? 
do you know who that is? Um, Rachel Dolezal? No, I, oh, she's that woman out in Washington State. Yes. Um, I think she has some um, personality disorders and psychological issues. And I think the press has made way too much of her. She needs help. Um, I'm sure she's done good things. But, or she wouldn't have been elected to head the NAACP group. But I think she's been built up way too much by the press and should get psychological help. So what made you want to be the first white woman to join Delta Sigma Theta sorority? Well, just by the luck of the draw, I had roommates who were Deltas. Um, didn't plan it that way. And the Deltas were very active in the Civil Rights Movement on campus. So these were the people I was hanging with anyway. And I wanted more of a social basis on campus rather than being primarily identified with the um, Civil Rights Movement, which I was very active in. So my person who came, became my roommate, Joyce Ladner, she was a Delta. And she was the one behind my getting to be a Delta. And um, good move, yeah. So, um, do you have any other goals in life you wish to achieve? Oh, clean up, cleaning my house, that would be a good one, but I'd have to stay home to do that. And my son has made this movie about me called An Ordinary Hero, and so people have been inviting me to come speak when they're showing some of the movie, particularly the Deltas, they're really behind it. And the fact that it's been 50 years, these 50th anniversaries of the, of the of SNCC, of the Freedom Rides, of Freedom Summer, and you know, it just keeps going on with 50th anniversaries. And I think when you hit that, other people think, oh, that was important, I need to learn more about it. You know, for the first 30 or 40 years, it's just like, ah, eh, that's yesterday's story. But now it's become something, particularly with Obama and the White House, that um, people want to know about. So do you still have the necklace and piece of glass from the 16th Street Baptist Church? I do. Um, I still have that. It's hanging in the other room. But I think we've got some of the glass here. Um, well, now this is the necklace, a piece of ebony wood with a piece of the glass from the church. And these are some pieces of the glass that we picked up. You can see here where the stained glass was fastened into the window. And so I've got pieces for grandchildren. And this one I'm keeping. But I've given a lot of my civil rights stuff to the uh, new African American Museum at the Smithsonian, and they've even had some of the glass on display. Would you like to hold a piece? Sure. I would take it in when I was talking, even with second graders, and pass it around. I remember one girl in the second grade holding it just had tears streaming. So there's a few things I've kept that I um, use when I'm, I'm talking. To, you know, students. I kept a diary when we were in Hines County Jail with the Freedom Rides, and here it is. And we had to crumple it up. And back then, we didn't have these little tiny hymns like you have. Mm -hmm. That was considered cheap. We had hymns that were like this, and that was, you know, showed you had plenty of money. But I had a big ruffle over mine, and so we could open up the hymn a little bit. And after we got this good and soft, this was what they called rag paper, then we could fold it and slip it in our hem. And that way, if they had a shakedown, the, they searched us and everything, we figured they wouldn't find it. So things like that. That's my sentencing, um, where I got two months and $200 fine and two months suspended.
some things like this I've kept so that when I'm talking to a group of students I can show them, but eventually they'll either go to my son who made the film or to the African American Museum. The students, what I think is important for young people is to realize that you can make a difference, that something that concerns you, so you don't think girls are treated fairly. I don't know what you think is a problem, but say it was that, and you do something to try to change that, and one thing leads to another, to another, to another. The students who sat in became the ones who kept the freedom rides going, and when they got out of jail, some of them stayed in Mississippi and worked on community organizing, and that became voting rights, and it moved from Mississippi over to Alabama and led to the march on the Edmund Pettus Bridge where John Lewis and all got beat up and then that led to Lyndon Johnson, the president, who was only president because he was a Southern Democrat. That He'd been picked to run for vice president to carry the South and so he, and I don't think a Northerner could have done it, said we must have a Voting Rights Act, and when he leaned into the camera and said, and we shall overcome, and repeated it, and we shall overcome, that to me was an unbelievable moment. So our last question for you is, how do you feel about the Black Lives Matter segment? Hands up, don't shoot, I got my t-shirt, and I try to wear it about every other week somewhere. Um, but also, all lives matter. And what has amazed me is Charleston, South Carolina, when nine people were shot. There weren't riots, there weren't protests the way there had been in some places. There was the black and white communities of Charleston coming together supporting each other and calling for change. So we would like to thank you for letting us come here in your beloved home. Well, thank you girls for coming out. Let's have a hug moment. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's great. I'm impressed with what you all are doing, and this is your starting point. You don't know where it's going to lead you. You see something you want to do something about, it's like throwing a pebble into a pond, you don't know where those ripples are going to go. And so just do it. And maybe it doesn't go too far, but it could lead to the White House. Yeah. Thank you. So don't forget to follow us on Twitter at TK2LDC News. And subscribe to our YouTube channel at TK2LDC News. And we also have an Instagram, TK2LDC News 3. Have a wonderful day. And thank you for watching. Bye. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom over me and before I be a slave. I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free.